welcome to Hot Weekly. Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this is Haunt Weekly, a weekly podcast we haunted attraction, Hunter Entertainment community. Whether you're an actor, owner, or just plain aficionado, we aim to be a podcast for you. And we return to you with guests. I'm hoping that our technical obstacles are over. Yeah, hopefully. And that I'm able to get good audio and that we're able to get this version live. Because, my God, this has been a messy week from a tech standpoint. And none of it our fault. Um, absolutely none of it this time is our fault. But joining us this week is Donnie Hoover and Jim Mill, Meat Hook and Jim Millspaw from Wrestle Horror. Get the names right, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> Meat Hook, the name my spell checker hates out of everything there. Yes. It's fine with Millspaw. It's fine with Millspaw. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> no accounting for taste. Um, right. But yes, how are you guys doing? How are you two doing this week? Oh, doing good. Yeah, yeah, we're we're doing good, you know, doing our thing, and uh, we just got done. Uh, we just did a recording a few days ago with uh, Voice from Hell, Dick Terhune. Oh, mm-hmm. cool! Very cool. Yeah. That'll be coming out oh, tomorrow. Also, he, he was and, a lot and, of fun. And, and the week before that, you had us on. Yes, <clears throat> where we talked about this. Well, we're going to be talking about the day, but kind of from the reverse direction. Yeah, we're turning to your expertise on our topic, and vice versa. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> we're, I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it, because you guys are, you're wrestle whore. Why don't you actually, you tell about the podcast. Exactly. What the hell am I doing? You tell about the podcast. <laughs> you, you introduce yourselves and tell us yes. a little bit about you your history. Introduce yourselves while I sit by Jack and Coke. Exactly. Okay. You want to start, Jim? You want me to start? or uh, Donnie, it was your brainchild, so I'll let you start. Right. Oh, let's see. Wrestle whore was basically a concept I came up with. Uh, my background is in pro wrestling. Uh, I started pro wrestling back in 97, and currently I own my own pro wrestling promotion. So that is my uh, background. And then I also have a passion for horror and haunted houses. So I've worked with a couple haunts here and there, local in the Columbus, Ohio area. And uh, I got an opportunity to start my own haunted trail uh, with, a, with a group of got people that I met, and they wanted to put a haunted trail on their property. So we got to start one from scratch. So basically while I was out in the woods and building this trail and I was, you know, th- thoughts would pop into my head of, you know, how can I, you know, have this wrestler or wrestling storyline or something fit in with this haunt character or what could I do in this haunt scene and make it a little more violent using wrestling moves or, you know, some kind of actionable moves and just stuff like that would pop into my head. And then the more I would think about it, the more I started to realize that wrestling and horror and, and haunted uh, houses and haunted attractions were really similar and they had a lot of similarities and uh, which worked great for me because they were both my passions. So then I could basically, you know, do them both. And uh, if I just could figure out a way. So um, I, I started just basically thinking about the concept and then I realized that I wanted to do a podcast and uh, start, you know, building the brand, building the concept and the idea of it. So I was at the uh, Midwest Hunters Convention a couple years ago. It was the last one they had in Columbus. And Meat Hook was over there at the Big Scary Show booth. And so me being the person I am, I just walked right up to him and like, hey, what's up, man? You know, just kind of just kind of started chatting him up and started picking his brains about podcasting. And then uh, we started talking and it came out that, you know, I told him, well, I, had, I think I had my new Ohio wrestling shirt on or no, I had a trail shirt on. So uh, I came up that I owned a pro- wrestling promotion. And Jim was interested in wrestling. So we kind of just hit it off from the start. And uh, basically, long story short, as we... Too late. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> no, that sorry, that's a reflex. Done. That's a reflex. I've watched Clue too many times. That's a reflex. <laughs> right. I'm a huge Clue fan. All, all good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we just put it together. And uh, he said that, you know, if I work with him to help him do some wrestling stuff, he would work with me on getting a podcast going. So, you know, here we are. And uh, I'll follow that up by saying that uh, I have been in the haunted attraction industry for too many years. Um, I I have done a a lot of acting uh, at places like the Dent Schoolhouse. I've guest acted at Netherworld. I've acted at Scaratorium. Um, 
Indy Screen Park. There's a whole slew of, of haunts I've guest acted at. Uh, and as thing as time progressed, and I just I wanted to kind of slow down a little bit because I am a little bit up there in age. I mean, you can see the white in my beard. Um, I, I started a, an, an actor troupe called Mall, which uh, I would send them over to different attractions around the tri-state area of Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. And I would go out there and, and act every once in a while. And during all this time of haunted attraction acting and having a lot of fun, somewhere in the midst of that, I paired up with, uh, or I joined up with three other guys, Drew Badger, uh, Jason Storm, and Jerry Vane, and we created The Big Scary Show almost nine years ago. So I've been podcasting for almost nine years. So when uh, Donnie reached out to me, it was, uh, it was a perfect fit. Because I'm also a big pro wrestling fan, have been since I was 12. And what started out as just a, an opportunity to guest ring announce with Donnie's promotion turned into me being his ring announcer. So, um, you know, the wrestling and horror, they all go together in character development to the end product. So this concept that Donnie came up with just spoke to me and I said, well, let's do this and Let's let's see what we can do to combine it and get people from both sides in to listen. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, and you've had a lot of fairly big names on your show. Yeah, you managed mm -hmm. to. You've got quite a history you're racking up there. Uh, yeah, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, we are. We are. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we we've been doing wrestle horror now for almost a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And like I said, I am amazed at some of the people you've been able to get on, like Thunder Rosa and all that. Yeah. Um, just some amazing names on there. So, yeah, great stuff in there. And you introduced me that when we were on your podcast to some new names that I have had, to, I've since looked up and enjoyed. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you've had a lot of luck getting some great names on there. And I have been very impressed with your work. And I think the overlap, I agree that the overlap is completely appropriate. Yeah. So one of the questions I have for you is what's something very basic that from a wrestling standpoint, a haunter can learn? Like, is there like a, how to do a bump safely or something like that, that would add to the character? Yeah, that's, that's kind of one of the ideas. Um, probably I'd say one of the most basic things that you could incorporate is uh, basically learning how to throw a punch, a wrestling punch. And because uh, I've actually done this, I have a video. It's on our on our web page, and uh, it was me as my haunt character, and and I went into our clown scene where we had you know three or four clowns in there, and we basically just got into a fight. And the story was that they took the last piece of hanging meat, and and my character's name was Stitches, and Stitches got pissed about it, so he went into the clowns area and. Basically, it was a it was a it was a fight between the clowns and my my uh, butcher character Stitches, and it was probably the most watched uh, video on our on our our Facebook page at the time. And uh, so, I mean, yeah, just something like that. And uh, that's kind of one of the ideas that I've had is is wanting to incorporate wrestling into more haunt scenes to make scenes more safe, more violent, but safe. And uh, so I would say, yeah, yeah, just like learning how to throw a safe wrestling punch would be a, 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 an easy start. Yeah, I remember that um, – I can't remember who it was that talked about this, but they said that an idea he had for teaching people wrestling – this would also work in a haunt setting too – is mm -hmm. to have two people work together and do a match entirely with punches. Everything about it – no kicks, no holds, nothing – Entirely, you got to tell a story with nothing but blows, punches mm -hmm. and headshots, body shots, but it's got to be punches and to tell a story with that and how to tell it very simply, which, you know, I think from a physical standpoint, I want to get into more deeper stuff in a second. I think one of the things I would encourage haunters to look at wrestling for is selling, how to sell an injury, because mm -hmm. all the time I'll see people like, the, the killer comes up and stabs them in the back and they grab their head and they fall down like, <laughs> dude, he, right. he hits you like three feet lower. I mean, yep. <laughs> that's, that's, not where the, that's not where the damage was, man. Right, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, that takes you out. It's surprising how something that small can take you out of the moment. But when you watch wrestling and you see wrestlers, they occasionally make mistakes, sell mm. the wrong way or sell the wrong thing. 
you see how much it takes you out of the moment, but you also see that when they continue to properly sell it, like they're selling a, a knee injury early in the match or selling it to the late game, how much it sells the story, how much it pushes and advances it. And I think that's one thing haunt actors really could learn. Um, so yeah, I, I know I've encouraged people to watch Shawn Michaels matches because he's always been a master of selling. Who would yeah. you say for learning how to throw a, a wrestling punch and learning how to sell, who would be some of your people to watch? Um, in my opinion, Ric Flair has probably the best punch. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, as for, yeah. As for selling, I would say, I mean, I like Triple H. I like the way Triple H sells. You know, that's going to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the Ric Flair, did you see his 30 and 30 on ESPN? No, I heard about it, but I've never got to see it yet. Have yeah, he talked about how, yeah, he, I, oh, sorry, Jim, yeah. Did you see the 30 and 30 on Ric Flair? Uh, I have not. Yeah, well, one of the things he talks about is how he developed that wrestling punch. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he taped up a piece of string in a doorway and stood in front of it and threw punches at it until he was hitting it full force and that string wasn't moving. Mm -hmm. that, he just did that every night before going to bed, and that's how he learned how to do it. Yep, I kind of learned a different way, but same uh, same concept. There was mm -hmm. a our, there was a metal pole in our our uh, wrestling gym, and I learned with that. And the way I taught myself to do it is if I hit it and it hurt, then I was hitting it too hard. <laughs> so, so, the opposite of punch, basically, with the same idea. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, the it also it also it helps when your partner. Now, uh, I mean, yeah, Rick. Uh, his practice and Donnie's practice, but you've got to have a partner that trusts you to throw that punch. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, whereas I, I don't have the wrestling background Donnie has, I, I, I watched so much wrestling over the years that I picked things up. And, and when I, and during my time at the Dent schoolhouse, uh, to, when I think it was my last year there. I played a butcher uh, in their queen city slaughter yard. And I had a victim in my hanging pig room. I had pig carcasses all over the place. And it was a young lady who trusted me implicitly because it would look like I would snap her neck on a nightly basis. And wow. it was realistic as hell. And she would drop. She didn't matter what, you know, she sold it perfectly. I, and I don't think she's ever watched wrestling, but she followed my direction. She followed my lead. And we got some great reactions out of it. Mm -hmm. So how do you teach that in the haunt industry? How do you teach that? Like with the girl who wasn't a fan of wrestling, how did you I, teach her? And, and Donnie, have you taught anyone how to do that? Uh, well, I'll say this, uh, this young lady, um, she'd been haunting for a few years. So she kind of understood where I was coming from. I, I generally take the lead in the room I worked in because of my experience and I just showed her, I walked up to her and I told her, I said, this is what I'm going to do. And I would wrap my arms around her head like this. And it would look like I snap her neck and I just pull my hands apart. But the way it looks, it looks like her neck is snapping as I do, as I pull apart. And we worked on, we practiced it a little bit. We went over it, you know, probably for about a half hour before we were comfortable with it. No. Um, and, and she, you know, she sold it from then on out. I mean, she, she learned quick and, it was completely painless, but looked incredibly painful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's I could things see that like working. learning how to turn yeah. your head the right way for the motion and how to do things like that. Right. And how to collapse yeah. afterward. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> and that's something that a lot of people that are new to wrestling don't realize is that the person taking the move is usually working harder than the person giving it. Mm -hmm. Or is very often at the very least. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most of the time, the person taking the move is doing all of the work, so to speak, and the one giving it is just basically helping to protect the other wrestler. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Which is why Bill Goldberg never worked a day in his life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so you talked a little bit about how um, how you've brought wrestling into haunting. Did you mm -hmm. take anything from haunting into wrestling? The opposite direction. Uh, not in the ring. I stepped away from in-ring action quite a few years back. Um, but I have taken my wrestling character and I've written an outline of a story, a book, and I've basically turned my wrestling character into a haunt character, a horror character. So I have done that in story form, but I haven't done it physically. 
But I mean, as for to follow up on your question before, uh, right before our trail got shut down, um, we had to shut down. The property owners had uh, idea, other ideas and didn't want to continue doing the trail after a couple of years. But uh, right before we had to shut it down, we did actually have a couple or a few trainings to where we had some actors that wanted to do. Because after they saw the video of me and the clowns getting into our fight, they wanted to do stuff like that, too. So we did have a couple classes where we would train them, was training some of our actors. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I had full plans to take this idea and incorporate it into our trail hundred percent. Well, you know, like I said, unfortunately it got cut short. And um, so, yeah, to answer that question, you know, yeah, we did start to practice that concept and I did go into a little bit of training and uh, yeah, like I said, you know, we ended up having to shut it down. So it's on standby until another opportunity arises, I guess. Okay. And do you do any consulting with haunts to um, teach them these I mean, techniques? I haven't, I haven't yet, but I, I, I'm, I'm not open to it. I'm definitely open to yeah. it. And, well, uh, you so, heard it here yeah. first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like I said, in my mind, just like for one example, you know, just a simple scene of a you know, room with blood and body parts laying everywhere and you have a table, you know, and to make it safe on the other side, like the wall you have padded the floor on the other side of the table you have padded and you have two to three, you know, female actors working with you as the victims. And, you know, throughout the night, you know, you, you walk into this scene, you got this maniac, you know, coming out into the scene, you know, ranting and raving, throwing a fit. And he just grabs this female victim. And of course, you know, she's screaming bloody murder and grabbing your arms, trying to fight you. And you literally just pick her up by her neck and her head and throw her over a table. And she smashes through, you know, over the table into the wall and then behind the table on the ground. And then, you know, after, as soon as you throw her, you take off after the customers. I mean, that's something not a lot of people's probably seen. And, you know, seeing an actual female bloodied victim like flying over a table through a room, you know, so that would kind of be like a shock value. And, you know, like I said, of course, everything would be padded and protected for the safety of the of the female actors. And, of course, you know, the females would either be trained wrestlers or trained haunt actors in wrestling. But um, that's just kind of like one idea, you know, something because I've never been to a haunt myself where I've actually seen somebody grab a person and throw them across the room or get like physically violent with them like that in that way. But uh, so that's just like I said, that's something in my mind as in one quick off the top of my head way to make things more violent and uh, try to shock the customers a little more. And I, I, I've got to agree with Donnie on that. And I will say that during that same period of time where I had the young lady that I trained to snap her neck, uh, there was a couple nights she could not make it and I had to substitute in there. Uh, so I had to do something quick and dirty to, to make it still look realistic. And she was about five foot four, weighed about 90 pounds. Um, so what I did with her was as I chased her around the room, I would grab her by the throat and pin her and lift her up off the ground and pin her against the wall. Now, of course, the whole time her hands were on my wrists. Yeah. But pe mm. people don't, don't register that. They see a, a hand around the throat, her feet off the ground and don't realize that she's really hanging on by my wrist. Yeah. No, they think that she's trying to pull you off of her. <clears throat> right. Exactly. And uh, again, you know, quick learner. I'm grateful for those. <laughs> it makes my job yeah. a whole lot easier. Yeah. Yep. We're we are being assaulted in this room by a wayward cat that has yes. wandered in. <laughs> Usually, um, he's inside. You, you were supposed to be inside, you little dumbass. <laughs> yeah. But I see that did that didn't happen. But it's okay. You know what? A snowball can be a, a member of the podcast tonight. It's fine. Do you have any yeah. questions? <laughs> uh, well, Jim. I've got to say uh, something else interesting here because finding out that you've been doing ring announcing, a doesn't surprise me. Oh, you've <laughs> Not got at a all. voice for that, it. That fits perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. But I, one of the things I think wrestling can teach haunters is not just selling and you know taking bumps and all that, but also about the need for the hype and the kayfabe that surrounds it, the universe around it. What has being a ring announcer taught you about being a haunter or working or building a haunt? Uh, quite frankly, nothing. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, I've been oh. I've been haunting for years. I've only been a ring announcer for a couple. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
Well, why'd you bring the other way then? (laughs) With me being a ring announcer, um, it just gives me a, uh, it it brings a childhood dream to life to be a part of a wrestling match in some way, shape or form. Um, But what really I find fascinating is, is the character development that a Han actor goes through is very, very similar to what a wrestler goes through. You have to develop a character. You have to create a backstory. You have to have your attitude. You've got to have the 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 charisma. You've mm-hmm. got to make the character 100% believable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a ring announcer, yeah, I, I get up there and I, my voice booms. Not the first time I did it, to be honest with you. But after I got, after I settled down and the nerves went away, it was much different. Um, but... I kind of take some of my haunt acting stuff for the voice projection and put it into my ring announcing. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that like a ring announcer's job is in many ways very similar to the front of house people's job in a haunted attraction. Right. They're supposed to hype the crowd, get people amped and mm-hmm. get them to focus in and get into the universe of the show because a, a wrestling match and a wrestling event is kind of a universe unto itself. We talk about kayfabe and wrestling. Right. You're really asking the audience to come with you on this journey to this alternate universe where all of this is real and you know people don't get arrested for doing this, basically. <laughs> you know? I mean, if you watch anything that happens in any major wrestling promotion, you're like, where are the cops? <laughs> right. <laughs> where are the cops and all this? That's that's murder or attempted murder at the very least. I think that's part of a sport. But you know, you're you're asking the fans to come with you on this journey. Um so yeah, I think that's one of the things is seeing how announcers and the outside of the ring stuff sets the stage is also useful. Something I was thinking about because yeah, a lot of there's a tendency in wrestling at the very least to kind of among wrestling fans, not so much wrestlers to kind of discredit all the out of the ring stuff, not realizing right. how important it is in setting up what's in the ring. Mm-hmm. Well, like, like, like wrestlers get it, but fans, some fans are stupid. I, I will <laughs> say, you know, that uh, as a ring announcer, yes, we've got to hype up. We've got to get the people excited for the next wrestlers that are coming out. And it, and it's not just a simple matter of going and weighing 235 pounds from somewhere in Georgia, AJ Swaggle. You know, it's it's not that simple. That's kind of boring and bland. You gotta you gotta project that energy and make the people feel it. Um, and actually, um, when we were talking to Dick Trahune the other night, he actually asked for an example of my ring announcing skills, and I gave it to him on on our recording. <clears throat> I didn't do it exactly the way I should have, but. My point was across, and 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 there was a, there was a generation of of energy, and and Dick, being the voiceover artist that he is, appreciated it and complimented me, which I, you know, that's probably one of the best compliments I'll ever get. Mm-hmm. There you go. I dig that. <clears throat> so, I have a broad question. There seems to be a, a very large crossover between wrestling fans, horror fans, and haunted attraction fans. What do you think is the cause of that, that, that crossover? It's not immediately obvious, I think. But what do you think causes that crossover? Uh, I would say violence and entertainment. <laughs> Pretty much. Fair enough. <laughs> yep. So they're, all okay. lot, they're, they're all violent, uh, violent forms of entertainment. But they're safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing. It, yeah. it, it allows the person, whether they're going to a wrestling match, to a horror movie, or to a haunted attraction, to a to see and be a part of something violent, but still being in a completely safe environment. Mm-hmm. And knowing everyone's coming out the other side okay. <laughs> right. Not just them, um, everyone else is too. And yeah, that's a good point because like I never really got that much into UFC and all that type of stuff. It seems like a natural extension, but I, I never just got into it much. A, I got tired of spending tons of money on 30 second matches. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's always a disappointment when you buy the big UFC pay per view and it's <laughs> so well. Good night, everybody. We're done. <laughs> yeah, but you know, if you get a WWE pay per view, you're going to get three hours of entertainment. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, and then same with AEW and the other major promotions. You know, you're right. getting hours of entertainment, and 
they'll sometimes pull the, like the eight second match looking at you, Seamus versus Daniel Bryan. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, they'll sometimes do it, but it's stupid rare when they do, and it's to get heat and to make them make you hate someone when they do. <laughs> um, yeah, so it does happen, but it's super rare. But uh, yeah, I, I I never became a UFC fan. I never became a major boxing fan. I had times where I was sort of into it, but never got into it as much or as long term as wrestling. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah. I think the, our biggest UFC watch was when we were actually doing yeah, training in it. Yeah, back in two thousand four, yeah. two thousand five. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, we were we were actually doing Krav Maga slash you know MMA style training at that time. A little bit of both. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. But you know, Katrina had other plans for my martial arts career. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there you go with that. Um, yeah, I would also so, say probably entertainment and, and storytelling would be uh, another reason why. Because yes. you know, if, you, if you're a fan of haunted houses, you don't just go just to try to get scared. You when you go there, you know, if you're a real fan, you go there. You know the story of the of the haunt that they're trying to tell. You know the history. When you go into certain rooms, you know the story behind what each room is and what the purpose of the actor in there is. Like if you're in a room with like a before a bunch of bloody hanging meat, you know, you obviously know you're not in a clown scene. You know, you're in a butcher room. <laughs> And, you know, just and the same with wrestling, you know, you watch wrestling for the stories. You know, they always say it's a male soap opera, so to speak. But, you know, yeah. so that's yeah, kind of it. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and wrestling has like three layers of story in and of itself. Like every match is a story. Sometimes the, the story is big guy squashes little guy and that's the story. Mm-hmm. Um, dude, get, dude, or, dude or lady gets their ass whipped. That sometimes is a story. Sometimes that's simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but then that plays into the story of the characters, which is completely separate. And that has a longer arc. And that plays into the story of the entire promotion, which itself has its own arc and its own, you know, setup. Right. And that's actually something that we ding haunts on is that they don't have a cohesive story yeah. and we can't tell that this is all one haunt or that it's all supposed to be together. We, we call them out on it and the reviews that we do. Yeah, and that's, and, it, and more haunts are like that than you would think. Yeah. There was a time, like, I, I call it the old spook house style of haunt, where every room was just a random different room. This is the mad scientist room. This is the butcher room. This is this is the hall of mirrors room. Whatever what random crap they came up with. And, and yeah, the rooms can be really good, but you're going through it. There's nothing pulling it together. Mm-hmm. There's nothing uniting this and telling a bigger story. And I think that's something that... A lot of haunts have gotten a lot better at. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's something that, you know, as we're talking about character development and things that a lot of haunts can learn from because not many have, you know, the big draw. They don't, they don't have a a headlining character or a character that they can promote and, you know, make money just off of that one character. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say some of the larger haunts, um, mm-hmm. Out there, definitely do have their what they call icon characters, which people yeah. come to see. Yep. Um, at the Dent Schoolhouse, Charlie the Janitor. Uh, people people come just to see Charlie the Janitor. Um, Bud Strauss and his team there have uh, really created their stories well and their and their their haunt very well. They've got they've got uh, jo- uh, Josh Wells who does their set design. And he's He's got a college degree in, in, in theater set design from Northern Kentucky University. And that's what he does. He builds sets for the haunt. Um, yeah. But they've all it, it, the three of them, that uh, Bud, Chuck, and, and Josh, have really created a great storyline. And, and, they, and they make it fresh every year because you've got to keep it fresh because if it gets stale, people aren't going to come. Right. So, but what people don't realize is haunts – and wrestling promotions, especially the larger wrestling promotions, have a team of writers that work to, to write these stories. And yeah. quite frankly, one of the best story arcs I have ever seen in wrestling to this day is the NWO story arc. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Starting, yeah. starting where, when Sting was suspected of being a bad guy. I, you know, I... Not, Go I'd go back further and say when Scott Hall and Kevin Nash first rocked up at WCW and no one had any idea what the hell they were doing there. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Then it goes like to the Sting, and then you can go on. Sorry. No, that's okay. Then Sting, 
You know, he went silent for over a year. It's almost a year and a half before he said a word. But he would mm-hmm. appear all the time. And they kept building that story and it building that arc. And it culminated with him facing Hollywood Hogan at Starcade, which they screwed up. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, that, was, that was just, that was disheartening after all that buildup. But it was a great story arc. I mean, the whole thing, NWO, Sting, the whole ball of wax until they started overdoing the NWO and then they had the wolf pack and they had this thing and that thing. and Everybody was in the NWO. And then that's when they went all to hell. Yeah. It got over. It got, it, it, it got too big for its britches, so to speak, but that's a great example of long-term storytelling taking place, you know, week after week after week for, like you said, several years there. Ultimately, if you go from when, Paul and Nash showed up, just like rocked up the WCW. Right. And it's like, what what are these WWF guys doing here? <laughs> you know, and then you go all the way through the Sting Hollywood Hogan thing and even the Goldberg thing. Mm-hmm. You got about three years of TV viewing there. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and all of it was very that's how they beat uh DDF in the ratings war those those the, during that time too. That was how they did as well as they did. Well, and it also shows you how it can be a letdown if the payoff at the end isn't so good, because we've been to a couple of haunted houses that did that, one that did it very well and one that did it very poorly, where Mm -hmm. they started out with the introduction of the main character at the end, the big, the big reveal. Um, And then one of them, uh, the big reveal was not inspiring at all especially being from new orleans Mm -hmm. and one of them they they did a really good payoff but that was um in chicago with um uh was one of the one yeah yeah they started saying the witch's name at the very beginning and then then at the end they had the big like ritual scene and you could tell that you know they carried it throughout and I really think, like, what I, I do think haunts could learn a lot from wrestling, mostly because wrestling has kind of a lot of the same limitations as haunted attractions, if you think about it. Right. We're stuck telling stories without using our words a lot of the times. We have to tell it through our actions, our facial expressions, the decorations we have, the setup. We have to use visual things we don't get to speak a lot we don't have a lot of time to say things and we have this thing we have to tell in a tight time constraint how long are you in a haunted house a big haunt you might be in for 30 minutes yeah. that's the length of a sitcom you know yep, you're yep. trying to tell a movie movie's worth a story in that time you know you, you got a whole buggy <laughs> you gotta, yeah. you gotta keep that plot moving so i'm gonna switch it up just a little bit here okay. um so are you still doing the wrestling promotion now in the time Donnie, yeah. in the time of COVID and how has it changed? And are you, and what did you see when, cause I know you went to several haunts. How was the experience different this year? Uh, we have currently not ran any events since COVID. Our last one that we were scheduled to do was for the Arnold sports festival back in March. And uh, we were supposed to show up, at on thursday to start setting up and the tuesday before that was when governor dewine came on and basically shut the city down so yeah yeah, so we had you know two days of scrambling to to, to figure out if we were even going to be able to do the event or not and the day of setup on thursday was when they finally said that we were you know canceled and not going to be doing the event and i haven't ran any since then because of the we have a ohio athletic commission and with all the restrictions and, and all the stuff that they have in place, it doesn't make financial sense for to us to run an event right now. Right. So we are scheduled to be at the Arnold again next year in 2021. And we just found out that they've rescheduled it for June so far, but they may try to move it up to May. So hopefully by then, you know, this will all be a little easier to do and, and we'll be able to go there. So, um, yeah, so we've been basically on hold for the, since March of last year or not March of this year. I'm sorry. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it and, feels uh, like last year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And but it's been a long hard. year. <laughs> yeah. but the past decade we've yeah. been on hold. Who knows? Yeah. And for right. time. And that's, that's heartbreaking to hear. Yeah, um, it is. Mm-hmm. So how will you get your wrestlers back up to speed, especially if you don't have a lot of, um, time when they tell you that yes, you can perform, 
to mm. actually being able to do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, some of the wrestlers, cause there is promotions here in Ohio that's starting to run again. So some of the wrestlers I use are back to work again and, and getting in some ring time. Uh, and actually the, the weekend that I have to be at the Arnold, I've already got it all booked and scheduled. So it, it, yeah, we're kind of just on standby on time on when it's going to happen. And then, uh, so say for instance, if they schedule it for June and some of my wrestlers are already booked in June, then I have plenty of time to find replacements. So it, it's not going to be a real big transition for us to get ready because we're kind of pretty much ready to go as is just a few little odds and ends things to do here and there. But, um, yeah, it's, it is difficult because I mean, like I said, with the way things are and, you know, we like, there's an, uh, uh, an event could be scheduled next weekend and they could get shut down, you know? So it's, you just don't know. And, and here in Ohio, yeah, yeah the, the restrictions are so tight, you know, that it's hard to make a, a decent income or even break even by, you know, by the standards that we got to go by up here. Yeah. And th that's been, I think the frustration for everyone It's just how unpredictable everything has been. Mm -hmm. Some of that's the nature of COVID. Some of that is state and local government, national governments and the right. changing legal fronts. Um, and some of it's just, we don't know what the hell we're doing. This is new to everyone. Yeah. Uh, I I've never been through a pandemic before. <laughs> All right. First one. Anyone here old enough to remember the 1919 one? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Not anyone here is. No, I don't know the podcast. At least maybe we can maybe we can find a 1919 flu pandemic survivor and bring them on. They've been beating COVID, so I'll tell you it was uh, when uh, when Donnie told me we weren't doing the Arnold. I was kind of upset. I mean, for several reasons, just like he was. You know, we we look forward to doing this. No, but no. I had just bought some fly new shoes for my ring announcer gear. <laughs> You know, I got these bright, I got these, I got these beautiful bright red shoes because our our wrestling promotion, Donnie's wrestling promotion, I should say, is is red and white, mm -hmm. the colors. So I had these red shoes. I, I had my black suit, a new bow tie. Um, I was ready to go, and they shut it all down. I was like, damn it. <laughs> so I haven't. I did have one opportunity to wear them, and that was out on my anniversary on Halloween. Nice. There you go. Nice. That's a good opportunity. That's a, yeah. that's a good reason. You sort of but took yeah. a picture of them bad boys. <laughs> well, no, it was like it, for, for us with our haunt. I know we talked about this earlier in the podcast. It was it was funny because we canceled to do COVID because we just couldn't figure out how to make it work with the city restrictions, right? And then to do it safe. And we also had struggled because a lot of our actors have pre-existing conditions, and we just we got to where we had two thin of a crew anyway, really. Yeah. So we canceled due to COVID. And then three days before, or the day, like two days before we would have opened, we got hit by Hurricane Zeta, which is like, what the fuck, a hurricane in late October? This is some bull right. crap. <laughs> this, this, this is this is kicking us when we're down, man. That's not even yeah. funny. Right. Yeah. So to the second part of the, yeah. the question, um, when you went to Haunts, how was it different this this year than previous? Um, yeah. just, yeah, they were just more you know, strict on keeping you, you know, apart, making sure you had your mask on. Um, I, there was one I went to where they actually did temperature checks. Uh, the other few handful I went to didn't, but they did have us, you know, spread apart. You know, they went by the protocol best they could. I didn't you know, see anything like malicious, like Hans not giving a shit and just doing what they want there. I didn't see any of that. And, That's uh, good to hear. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, for the most part, um, everybody played by the rules best they could. And I didn't get out to as many as I wanted to. I wanted to hit a few more. I actually wanted to go out to Dent, which is mentioned and uh, right. see, see a uh, pumpkin smasher. He's my favorite character at Dent. Just, <laughs> just so Max is on here and he hears that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think pumpkin smasher might be in the chat is what I was about <laughs> to say. <laughs> so, but yeah, like I said, as far as I uh, seen, I didn't see any, any kind of bad ill ill will and people trying to uh, you know, do stuff that they're not supposed to do and get away with it. So it was pretty pleasing to see. I think one of the problems haunts had was not necessarily ill will, just especially in the opening weekends, it was just overwhelming trying to a figure out how this is going to work and b the fact everyone and their brother decided they wanted to go to a haunted house on opening weekend. Things seem to settle down a little bit for most haunts, which is good, but 
Mm-hmm. I swear to God, those opening weekends, I mean, as we were doing the news from Haunt Weekly, it was tragic no. how it went. Yeah. It was just tragic. So did you see any um, scares that were set up differently to handle the COVID restrictions? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, said, I, I don't know about so many set designs type of stuff, but I did notice that the actors were staying a lot further back. And, you know, of course, the actors had masks on and the masks were painted to match their characters and all that. But, um, yeah, I did notice that kind of stuff. And uh, I noticed, uh, like, uh, the haunt that Donnie and I went together to. uh, We were going to do Facebook Live when we went, but where we went, there's absolutely no cell signal whatsoever. (laughs) Right. So we didn't get to do it live. But um, it's called Backwoods Oddity. Shout out to Alan Schell. Okay, the name backwards should have indicated the cell signal issue. I'm just saying. <laughs> that was totally foreseeable. We didn't think that far out, did we? <laughs> no, and I should have known better because I've been out there many years and I never have a cell signal. <clears throat> but I kept hoping maybe on a different cell service, maybe I'd get a signal, but no no luck. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, in certain scenes, they had actors behind a cage, right. which was great for the distancing, and I appreciate it. But it still it still worked with the scare. I mean, they were able to to work even though they were away from you. So overall, it was a, it was effective. But being a former Q line actor, um, mm-hmm. you know, all your teeth get pulled when you can't get right up in somebody's face and go, "I'm going to eat your soul," you know. Right. Uh, so even the Q line actors had to stay apart, but. Um, one of the Q line actors we were, when we were out there, I actually trained and I taught him how to scare from a distance and he did well. And it's a very simple, I mean, anybody listening and watching a very simple, if you're a Q line actor, if you want to creep people out from a distance and you can't get in their face, just stand and point at them. (laughs) Think about that. Yeah. Yeah, That's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. You point at one person a creepy way and it's going to stick with him, and I know it. And it worked. I watched it work while I was there. He did a great job. Cool. One thing I think would be funny to do, and I just came up with this idea, is point at someone, and if you had like a fake assistant or someone, like writing down the name and the description of the person. <laughs> like, oh, like you're going to get it. You're going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, we did the thing. Obviously, we've done the thing with getting people's names and using that in the hall and yeah. scaring them. Yeah. Like I, I still say the skull thing was our best, one of our best scares ever. People lost their crap over that or something. So stupid. it was A through Z, and then we just we moved, moved the skull the so the, the their slot was empty. Yeah, the, the skull collection because <laughs> the whole theme we had there was a serial killer that collected people by the, the letter of the alphabet, and so we just had twenty five skulls and twenty six letters, and we just move every time. <laughs> oh, let's see, it's it's. Bernadine, okay, well, the bee skull goes into the slot. <laughs> and, just the shoulder, and they would get to that room, and, the bee skull is empty! <laughs> yeah. People noticed that. It was incredible. I didn't think yeah. people would actually see it. I, I didn't either, honestly. <laughs> but, but, they um, but they did. So we're getting close to the yeah. end of the episode. There mm-hmm. is a question. You, you asked us a question that you ask every guest. I'm going to ask you a question. What's a favorite scare that you've either performed or seen in a haunted house? Uh, probably my favorite scare to date uh, was because it was such a simple scare, but it was like probably the most effective scare I've ever been a part of was we were working a home haunt uh, for our buddy, my buddy, Mike, and it was in our room. I was the butcher. So we just had basically this white room. Think of like Dexter. It was a white room with blood splattered all over the walls. And then I had me a little table with some, with some meat and, you know, my chainsaw and all that. Um, so it was just me as my character. And, but in a corner was uh, a buddy of mine and he was in a white sheet with blood splattered on his sheet to where he blended into the wall. So the, the whole scare was they came into to the room. I did my little spiel and growling and grunting and beating on the table. And I came out to draw him toward that corner of the room and as they started to go to that corner of the room, he just basically stepped out and this white sheet <laughs> got right in front of him. And I, I mean, that's probably the most scares I've ever gotten in a night. And that's it a beautiful just, to and startle there. Yeah. yeah, it was just it was just something so simple because you clearly I mean, it was hard to see him. And if you didn't know what you were looking for, you didn't see him at all. 
I um, always say the best scares are the simple ones because of the ones that are the most repeatable. And Ellie right. will like that answer because she was dot in a yeah, dot Yeah, she was room. dot in a dot room. It's a dot room gag, basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I know. also know at the Scaratorium, there was a cotton candy wall that everybody <laughs> And it was the that, same thing. The, yeah, he was a the actor was dressed up with bags of cotton candy hanging off of him, and she would come in. He, he come walking out of the wall, and uh, so yeah, oh, like I said, just thinking about that. Oh, oh lord, <laughs> <laughs> oh lord, uh, no. so, Jim, uh, please, please alleviate. <laughs> oh, you know, there's been so many scares over the years. Um, so. It's hard to pick a favorite, but I'll pick one of the most entertaining. Okay. Um, I, again, was working at Dent, uh, and this is before they made the slaughter yard out back. We had a big uh, uh, fence maze out back there before they did that. And um, at this point in time, Dent had an app on your phone where if you uh, took a picture of somebody in the queue line, a monster would come out and take you away. Well, okay. I was the, I was the one back there that had the phone and I got a picture of a kid, he's about 16 years old, and I worked the maze and the queue line, so it worked out perfectly and I went and tracked this kid down and I brought two other actors with me. Both of them just as big as me, if not bigger. And he saw the three of us converge on him and he sprinted. <laughs> but he couldn't. He could not get away from us. We caught him. And Jason, who is my late business partner for the mall, he grabbed this kid, threw him over his shoulder, and dragged him into the middle of the maze and let him go. No friends, no nothing. <laughs> okay, that in and of itself was entertaining. However, as I'm working the queue, Jason sticks his head out. He goes, "Come here." So we go back behind scenes. And he goes, "Dude." That kid pissed all over me. <laughs> and he was drenched in urine on the right side of his body. And he didn't change his costume. Adds it's, to the ambiance. Uh, it's ambiance at that point. He stayed that way the rest of the night. And I promise you, unfortunately, I bet that kid never comes back to Haunted House. Yeah. Yeah, that's and a little for the Listeners who are listening and not seeing the live chat, um, how big are you? Because you say uh, as big as you. So <laughs> uh, I'm six foot four, three hundred pounds. Gotcha. <laughs> now, now give us context for the uh, people in audio because yeah, that's right. important. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. Well, you look shorter sitting down too. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> I feel like I have any idea. Like you could be a, a twelve foot tall giant. No, no. <laughs> you're, right. you're just in a very big room. <laughs> uh, Jason, Jason was six foot three, about two eighty. Hmm. Yeah. So wow. it was, you know, you get these, and 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 uh, the third guy in this, in this uh, haunted, whatever you want to call it, uh, his name is Kirby, and he was about six foot and about three forty. Hmm. Yeah. So when you've got yeah. those size guys converging on you, you know something's going down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's new in New Orleans. It could mean a different kind of fun, but. Um... <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, yeah. I, I've been in New Orleans too long. I've been corrupted. Well, Cincinnati's <laughs> a little too conservative, but, you know, what do you say? <laughs> I like That's New fun. Orleans. And we've got a question from the chat um, okay. about, so you could touch the patrons there. Um, that was a, a special deal for that year only. We were allowed to touch. Um, they never did it after that because later on that season, um, somebody got uh, – allegedly got hurt so they stopped doing it unfortunately but mm -hmm. and it's for the best because unfortunately yeah, but scaring people without touching them i think is more fun oh yeah it, it challenges you more um i do like the fact that we were able to touch people and we still try to we still tried to every once in a while nothing major you know a little flip of the hair or tug of the hoodie uh, but during that time yes we were allowed to touch um, and we would not be reprimanded for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's something that we discuss often is, is touch versus no touch, touch versus and, no touch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then I go back and forth on it because I think touch haunts can add something, but I've seen it executed so poorly so many times. 
yeah. I'm still kind of down on it. Well, and I think that the extreme haunts can go back to what you were saying about picking up someone and throwing them across the room. They could go in that direction where it's not extreme, just touch, touch, touch the customer all the time. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. but give you visual impact as well. Yeah. Right. Well, I, uh, I have a, you know, in my opinion, you know, people that do the extreme haunts that are, you know, and a lot of them are sort of careless in some sense. Yeah, you know, my fear is that if people do try to do that with the extreme haunts, they won't take the proper safety precautions and they'll end up hurting their own actors, which, you Fair know, enough. if you're going to do stuff like that, protecting your actors and actresses should be your number one priority, bar none. Always. hundred percent. Yeah. Safety first, safety left, safety, everything in between. <laughs> yeah. Hey, new shirt. <laughs> new shirt. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't actually do the announcement this no, week, did we? No, but that's okay. That's okay. We'll do it next week. Yep. But, guys, uh, we have just a few minutes left. Once again, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can listen to you, where they can catch all the rest of the awesome stuff that you're doing. You want to take that, Jim, and close it out? <laughs> Absolutely. You can find us on WrestleHorror.com. You can go to our Facebook page, WrestleHorror. Instagram at Wrestle Horror, Twitter at Wrestle Horror. Uh, you can find us on most um, major podcast outlets, including Apple Podcasts, uh, Amazon Alexa, and I bet my Alexa is going to trigger now. Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, Google Podcasts, Google Google um, Podcasts, Google um, Speakers, uh, the Google Assistant. Uh, you can find us on any of those outlets, Stitcher. God, how many others are there, Donnie? iHeartRadio. Oh, I can't keep track. Yeah. I can keep track. Well, I, I think that there is a theme there, though, yeah. that it's Russell Horror. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's, a, it's like we're equally boring. We're hauntweekly.com, Haunt Weekly Twitter, Haunt Weekly Facebook, Haunt Weekly uh, YouTube, which has all our prior episodes. And, <laughs> and basically, Haunt Weekly. It's, it's amazing. Nobody wanted these names until we got to them. It's right. like Nobody thought of these names. Nobody thought of Haunt Weekly or Wrestle Horror until we got to them. Right. So, we're either crazy or genius. One or the little, other. Monsters, we're probably a little bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, everyone, thank you very much for joining us. You just heard me say where to find us. You heard them say where to find them. Yeah. I think on that note, we're just going to say we'll see you all next week. Thank you to Jim and Donnie for a great chat. Thank you all who joined us live. Thank you all listening to us recorded. And we will see you next week and with something new. I have not a foggiest clue what. <laughs> so we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you. Have a good one.